Fortunately for everyone, I won a bet and we're getting a, a free lesson from Kosia on the King's Indian. I'm going to be very honest with you. It was a selfish choice because I wanted to learn in the King's Indian. One of the cool things about the King's Indian is there's many different ways to play it, even against like lots of variations. You know, people are always asking like, oh, what's the best line? What's the best line here? It's like, well, there's different ways to play it. You know, with black, you can play E takes D4 and open the center. You can play with knight D7, knight C6, knight A6, right? So there's lots and lots of different um, styles when it comes to the, the King's Indian. Yeah, first line I wanted to talk about comes in the classical variation. This is definitely always been considered one of the main lines, like one of the most classical approaches to facing the King's Indian. White just takes a ton of space in the center and then develops like with the most natural moves. Knight f3, bishop e2, black goes e5, white castles. Here we have kind of a critical position where like the main move has long been knight c6. But of course, nowadays there's other options as well, like with knight d7 is very popular. Okay, there's a lot of options here. And actually one option that's really I think had a resurgence recently at higher levels is the bayonet attack. So d5, knight e7, and then b4. And the interesting thing about this one is like many, many years ago when I was first like learning d4 as white, um, I remember looking up theory against the King's Indian and back then like this was, this was all the rage and you had games with like Van Whaley against like Rajabov and like all these big match, like Gelfand, all these players. Um, and then this was super popular, but then for many years, uh, the other move, knight e1, kind of took over. Um, and knight e1 actually used to be the main move that they played like in the 50s, in the 60s. Like when they were first like entering these positions, this was always the classic approach for white to transfer the knight to d3. And uh, there was, of course, huge, huge battles here. Um, and so this, for, for many recent years, became the main line with Wesley So playing this one a bunch, Ding Loren, all these guys. And of course, like... Uh, Nakamura and players like Giri, Grischuk, uh, playing these positions on the black side. Um, but okay, in the last couple of years, the bayonet attack has come back and where white just tries to open up the queen side quickly and they don't really care about a5 because they're just gonna take and then go a4 and then eventually just kind of ram this pawn through um, with like bishop d2 and knight b5 and so on. Um, so black has definitely been under some pressure here and uh, one very cool line that players have started playing from this position, so instead of knight c6, instead of knight d7, instead of knight a6, is just this cool little move h6. I was not expecting uh, <laughs> this as even a move. I'm really curious to, uh, I guess you will, you will definitely tell us what is the idea of this uh, waiting move. I think this idea comes from Leela or, you know, one of the neural neural net engines. It's been played a couple of times, like it was played um, in the Olympiad and like in some big games as well. But yeah, essentially it's like a waiting move. It's taking the g5 square. Um, as you know, when white plays bishop e3, black often hits this bishop with knight g4, and then the response is often bishop g5, and then black has to play like f6 or queen e8. So this is kind of avoiding bishop g5 for the long-term future. And mm -hmm. um, it's also stopping like knight g5, which is of course a thing in these structures, especially like in the bayonet attack, when black tries to play for an early f5, whoops, white is often going like knight g5 and knight e6, and then just like being willing to sacrifice a pawn in e6 and opening up on the light squares, then it's considered a pretty pretty serious approach. So h6 is also useful to kind of cut out all kinds of uh, knight g5 moves. So from here, black's idea is to typically bring the knight to uh, d7, where it's gonna help support the e5 square. Um, and then even go knight h7, knight g5. So that's kind of the backup plan behind this h6 move. It's not just a waiting move, but black actually has an idea to play like knight h7, knight g5, and then challenge the knight on f3, and then this challenges the d4 square. What would you say is the main difference between playing h6 first and knight bd7 first? If we're trying to sort of transpose. Like if if I were to play knight bd7 first with the idea of to play h6 next, um, are there any advantages or drawbacks? Yeah, that's a good question. Honestly, like I'm not 100% sure. This one is a little bit more flexible because in some lines the knight can still go to c6. Um, mm -hmm. So for example, like if queen c2 here, then I think knight c6 is kind of a strong move. 
And generally the idea here is going to be to meet d5 with knight d4. Right. And if blacking in knight mm -hmm. d4 in safely, this is very typical King's Indian idea, folks. Try to remember this one. If you can get knight d4 and you're not losing the pawn, it's probably a good idea. Even if you are losing the pawn, but white has to give up like the dark square bishop, it might still be a good idea. Um, but here I think it is quite effective. Um, so I think it's just a little bit more flexible. Also, like let's say on knight d7, bishop e3 is one of the main moves. If you play knight g4 here, then you got to be willing to kind of play this structure that we mentioned, which is very playable, but is going to be um, quite risky. Um, whereas with h6, you kind of avoid these setups because then on bishop e3, you can go knight g4. And this is actually a funny question for the King's Indian player because after bishop to c1, from a theoretical point of view, you can just play knight f6. And as black, you know, you should be satisfied <laughs> to, to repeat the position, right? And ask white to kind of deviate if they want to play for more. Um, but of course, one of the big points of playing the King's Indian is to like play for a win every game, right? So you do have to kind of figure out what you're going to do here as black if uh, if your opponent goes this route. But thankfully, there are options. You can go knight d7, you can go knight c6. It's, it's all kind of playable mm -hmm. here, which is nice. Are we happy about having played h6 instead of knight bd7 here? Yeah, I think it um, doesn't make a huge difference. For example, if let's say we did play knight d7 and then white played d5, um, then we went like knight c5, queen c2, e5. Um, and a lot of these positions, black ends up just playing h6 anyway. And it's kind of okay. a very reasonable move. But also just kind of from like, let's say, philosophical point of view, I would say black is generally very happy to induce the move d4, d5. Because once white plays d5, that's what gives black... I know you understand this, but just for, for the chat, that's what gives black the, the green light to kind of go full steam ahead on the king side, because now the center is closed, there's less tactics. When white can still always take de5 in every position, then black has to be very careful about making too many like king side moves, because you got to make sure that the e5 pawn doesn't just end up uh, under huge pressure. It's like a waiting move. So we're waiting for white to define the structure. At some point, white either needs to play d5 or go d takes e5. Or they're just we're just going to take on d4 and just put too much pressure on there. So at some point when the structure gets defined, that's when black can kind of think about what plan they're playing for. So if white goes d5, then absolutely black, you can start with knight d7. I think a5 here makes sense just to carve out some space, like typical idea, and then even go like knight a6, knight c5. But once the center is closed, that definitely gives black the green light to play like knight h7, f5 and play for the king side play. But if white plays like de5, for example, which a lot of players do, and then like queen c2, for example, you know, just some random moves, then this f5 plan might not be the best, right? In this structure, the exchange structure, generally black is trying to put the pawn on c6 and then eventually get this knight to the d4 square. Either right away if they can, like here knight c6 might be a strong move, trying to play knight d4, or you can go the long way, which is through the e6 square, like knight d7, knight c5, knight e6, very typical maneuver to eventually get to the d4 square. So of course it depends on how the structure turns out, but that's kind of what I like about this h6 move, it's very flexible, and uh, both sides kind of have some options. So depending on the type of structure you get, that's what kind of informs uh, black's play. Because white can also try to keep the tension on d4, and I think this is what a lot of higher level players will do. They don't wanna play d5 or d5 too quickly. They wanna just play moves like rook e1, bishop e3, h3, things like this, and then wait for black. Because they really want black to take on d4, and then they can get this kind of like Marazzi bind type of structure. Which, by the way, is very playable. And at any point, black can take on d4 if they want and just kind of play that position, like knight d7, rook e8, knight c5. Just put the pieces on good squares, put pressure on the e4 pawn. If we want to go into this direction with white, bishop e3 is not really an option because of knight g4. So I see a move like maybe rook e1 because queen c2, there was knight c6. Right? Yeah, exactly. I think rook e1 is probably the main move here in like the most natural move. One thing I should mention is that if white plays h3, which is already also very natural to kind of prepare bishop e3, then here it makes a lot of sense to take on d4 as black. Because when you do take on d4, you play rook e8 and you put pressure against this e pawn. If white has already played h3 in these structures, it gives them a big question because either they have to play f3 here, which then opens up a bunch of dark squares and you have like knight h5 immediately and queen h4 and bishop e5 and just huge, huge counterplay on the king side. 
or white has to do something like bishop f3 to defend the pawn, but then this runs into our knight h7, knight g5 idea, which I think against this bishop is like pretty annoying. You're just playing knight g5, and then this one is under pressure too, and yeah, it's not so easy for white to um, to deal with this. So that's one kind of detail I want to mention here. Is like when white's playing h3 in these structures, it makes ed4 a lot more attractive because then because then it's harder for white to play f3 under under good circumstances. Then black has some options. I like knight d7. Yeah, essentially the plan from here is to go like knight h7, knight g5. I think it makes a lot of sense. You can also play rook e8 and opt for this um, e takes d4 plan. There was one game that I just wanted to share. Played here in St. Louis actually in one of the big, really strong round robins that they do. Cheka and Brandon Jacobson was playing um, black. But that game mm -hmm. continued bishop f1. In my opinion, I think knight h7 here is a very playable move, but he won rook e8, which is also totally fine. Um, I just want to show this game because I thought it was very, very cool. So white goes rook b1, one of many natural moves in the position. And this is like another reason why, you know, I always say like, Studying theory is probably not the greatest use of time because at a certain point, your opponent is just going to make some random move like rook b1, queen c2, h3, a3. Like you can't memorize everything. So I think it's much more valuable to just like try to study a lot of games, try to learn about different structures, different ideas, you know, different concepts and principles. And like then you can kind of build your knowledge based off that. Anyways, he goes e takes d4 here, which probably wouldn't have been my choice, but like it shows that. There's many different opportunities here. What I would have done is maybe like a5, just kind of trying to keep the position flexible, maybe even b6 somewhere, and then essentially just waiting for white to go d5 also, maybe knight h7 as well. I, I thought the way he played it was very interesting. So takes, takes c6, white went bishop f4, he went knight e5. And now the thing is with this structure, the d6 pawn is of course always gonna be kind of a critical weakness. That's why I don't like personally love it as black, but black's idea is to generate enough counterplay against white's e pawn and white's c pawn to kind of uh, balance it, right? So he goes a6. The point is to eventually try to get uh, b5 in, but actually game continued very interesting. White went queen d2, he goes g5, bishop e3, b5 now, b3, and can now I, knight h5. Can I just, yeah, yeah, can I just stop you for one moment? So mm -hmm. when they played a6, uh, just a few moves back, um, usually I'm guessing that if white tries to prevent b5 by playing a move like a4, then we would play a5 ourselves and get a knight to c5 and just start to get some control. Yeah, yeah, actually it's, it's a great question. Um, a lot of times the, re the response is a5. Yeah, you just spend this tempo, but you say that fixing these squares is a lot more important. Um, and then, yeah, it's like, it is kind of annoying for white, but black can try to bring this knight around to c5 then like queen b6, queen b4. And then there's a lot of just like weak squares that black's pieces can just start kind of stomping all over. Like b3 mm -hmm. also. So I, I think that would be the response. Okay, I'll just go through this game just because, you know, too much time I just thought it was a very interesting game, but why went knight f5? Black goes b4, knight a4, takes this one. And, uh, and then goes g4. So he's just ripping open the, the king side, especially the dark squares. He would love to get like takes, knight takes g4, and then bishop can come to e5 and queen h4. And um, now it's just kind of like very classic strategy where it's like black has given up the light square bishop. So he's trying to just play on the dark squares now because he has three minor pieces that can play in the dark squares. White has two, one of them is on a4 and the other one, of course, you know, light square bishop as well. Um, can participate. G4 white responded F4, and now G3. Just a beautiful idea. Wow. Yeah. So the point here is if white is taking, and black is taking on H2, and then the queen is coming to H4, so king H1, or knight G3, for example, I think is probably more accurate. Here it might be- We're winning even, the queen, right? Just might we're, be we're immediately. Playing. Yeah, exactly. Like with this yeah. classic. Mm -hmm. Classic puzzle rush combo. Um, so okay. I think takes is probably better. And let's say check king g1, something like this. But bishop e5, and the attack just looks monstrous. White played h3, he didn't take on, on e5, which I think is very reasonable. I mean, this this game, was, we could spend a lot of time on this game. I'll just play it through the most. So knight g4. Oh my goodness, knight g4, <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> so the attack it's continues. Beautiful. Now he, he wants queen h4 again. Um, his pawn on g3 is very strong. Bishop b6, queen h4, takes here. Rook d8, with wow. idea to 
sack the exchange in order to get bishop d4 in, yeah. at the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, just all on, on the dark squares at this point, black is willing to give up a rook for that dark square bishop. So he takes, knight takes f4, rook d1, and uh, yeah, the attack just kind of rages on. Um, White tries to get some counterplay, you know, with, with the c-pawn, um, but essentially is not in time. And actually what Brandon does with this move, I think, is he sets up his kind of eventual idea. So White gives check, c6, Black kind of lands this like winning knockout. So takes g2, and then rook e1. Very, very nice. The point is if White trades, and the queen is coming to e2, I think. So king h2, bishop e5, and and this was just this was game over. Now, there's just no defense to this, this attack. This is one of the most beautiful kings in the end. If we go into the, the d5 line, mm -hmm. um, let's say d5 over here. After setting up your uh, knight to c5, I'm guessing this is one of the ideas. You mentioned an idea with uh, knight h7, knight g5, which I was not really familiar with since... I didn't really look at positions with h6. I'm more familiar with the classic knight h5, knight f4, or even f5 here. So what, what justifies the shift of the plan here? Okay, let's say in this exact position, I would say instead of this immediate one, black should just play um, a5, for example, and bring the mm -hmm. knight to c5 first. And then from there, like knight h5 often makes sense, um, especially like, I feel like I've had this quite a bit lately, like queen c2, knight a6, here, knight c5, something like this, b3, b6. And then here, knight h5 and f5 make a lot of sense as a, as a plan. Um, the knight h7 comes into play, let's say when white is not releasing the tension with the d-pawn and plays like rook e1, for example, let's say knight d7 and then bishop f1. Um, here, I like this idea of knight h7 because it puts more pressure on the d4-pawn. And by playing knight g5, you're challenging the knight on f3. And so this is kind of forcing white to, to do something with, with this pawn. Actually, we can spend a little bit more time here. Like, So one of the ideas, for example, uh, let's say white goes bishop e3, knight g5, takes, takes. So black is wanting to play this structure. And now the idea is like, all right, you're looking to play like f5 and push on the king side. Um, the open h file can actually be used for your rook or like bishop f6, king g7, rook h8, like this. And if white is not still not pushing or doing anything with the d-pawn, now the plan actually is just, just to take on d4 at some point, put your knight on e5, and then you're using the g-pawn. I know you know this idea from the Benoni, you're using your g-pawn to not allow white to push f4. Um, so you're kind of mm -hmm. getting this, this grip and, and play on the, on the dark squares. The pawn on g5 looks absolutely great here because it can either remain on g5, but if you ever push it to, to g4, it would also be doing an offensive job. So if like queen d2, for example, like g4 might be playable, but simpler, it's like black can just take on d4. And this position actually I think is totally playable, like trading off the dark square bishops and then playing b6, for example, and then the knight comes to e5, bishop b7, queen f6. And then another, okay, big strategic point, if you trade the dark squared bishops in these kinds of positions, your queen has to then kind of take over and, and police the dark squares. It's very, very um, important. Whoever can kind of dominate this diagonal is usually going to be um, much happier. So this one, I think, is well, approximately equal. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was just wondering why did we need it to play b6? Oh, because 95c5, right? Yeah, 95c5, I think, okay. might be yeah, might yeah. be a little bit annoying. Mm -hmm. um, also, the yeah. bishop is, I think, pretty good here on, on b7. It'll put pressure on e4, and then if white ever plays f3, you know, there's always going to be like g4 in the position black can, can think about. There is a high-level game in the Olympiad, Prant Melkumian against Noderbeck Yakubov. Um, from the 2022 Olympiad. And actually, this was a very, very important game because this was Armenia versus Uzbekistan in, I think, a pretty late round. And both teams, you know, ended up, I mean, Uzbekistan ended up winning. I think Armenia got third. So it continued like this. It was like D5, E5, F3. And this position definitely was like a lot, let's say, quieter. Like there was this like slow buildup. Both sides have kind of a harder time um, getting their their play going because black has this grip on the queen side. And then um, when black goes like f5 here, white is probably gonna play like h3. So it's not 
that easy for black to break through on the king side here. But anyway, this is a very interesting game. People can can check it out um, and end up in, in a draw, I think. It's actually a very like solid game. One of, wasn't one of these like wild King's Indian games, you know, it's just like <laughs> the evaluation swings mm -hmm. back and forth. It was like very strategic and, and well played. When white goes for a plan like rook b1, a3, b4, is there a way to contain that? Or you're just slowing them down and they still will run you over in the long run on the queen side? There are some ideas. You can play bishop d7, queen e8, and then get ready to meet a3, b4 with knight a4, which can be kind of interesting, like trading off. Without of taking the pawn. Um, Without taking on b4, right? I, just think, moving. I think probably with taking. It might depend okay. um, in different cases, but I think, I think either way. Also, you know, there are ideas to watch out for when you play like a4 yourself, and then you get the b3 square. It can be hard. Sometimes it's like a mistake to put the knight on c5 too quickly because then he just gets kicked with b4. You end up losing time. So it's like, yeah, there are definitely cases where black yeah. just leaves the knight on a6 and exactly. then just holds. Uh -huh. Because I've seen game where where black just goes for knight c5, not necessarily like at the top level, but a player, let's say they go knight c5, white just goes rook b1, a3, b4, they take, and then they have to come back to a6 or b7. But it's brutal because once the knight goes to a6, there's a bishop on f1, right? You, you play c5, the knight is under attack. Even yeah. knight b7 it looks very passive here. So I was just wondering in general, what do we have to contain this attack? But your idea with bishop d7 and queen e8 looks great because at least we're finding a new square for the knight. Let's say, for example, you play like knight a6 here, or knight d7, white pushes d5, which is very typical. Um, and this is a line that often comes up, or a position that comes up from, from different move orders. You know, the knight could have mm -hmm. gone into c5 in different ways. Um, and here white often plays bishop g5, black goes h6, and then white brings the bishop back to e3. And there's some specific concrete reason why they do this. I forget exactly where, but in some lines it's like, it's actually, you know, the h6 pawn is hanging and, and white is happy. Anyways, black, I think for black, b6 here is now a very reasonable move. So if like b3, for example, let's say black goes knight h5, which I think is very reasonable, um, a3. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Do we have knight e4 and bishop f5 was, at the end? Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about it, but I'm not sure. Oh, no, no, there's queen h4. Yeah. There's queen h4. Sorry, right. I, I got really excited here. <laughs> no, I mean, sometimes this works... Even here, yeah. like you have maybe some e4 or uh, like bishop f6, but yeah, I don't think I don't think it does. Um, but I was looking okay. at it <laughs> as yeah. well. That's a very thematic trick. You always have to look at this one, especially um, if white plays like rook b1 and you have the skewer available. Uh, and mm -hmm. sometimes you know, you know crazy things happen. Like maybe white plays h4, <laughs> and, and now what? <laughs> now, now, so now, now it works. Yes. Yeah. Now it's like yeah. Now it would work, right? So. Um, so yeah, for example, like b3, knight h5, let's say a3. I think I had this in a recent game, maybe something similar. And like I played knight f4, but actually f5 would have been a lot stronger with the idea that now on b4, I can meet that with knight takes e4. You're meeting b4 with like bringing the knight back, then I think something might have already gone wrong for black. If they go ef5, you will take with the bishop. So you, you get square for the knight. I think you would take with the bishop yeah, especially if like white can't establish something on e4, I would say it's probably probably totally fine to do this and kind of like give up this square. Because um, here white would have to move like the queen or something and you get knight f4 in. I would say this looks pretty active for black. Queen f6, g5. If we take with a g pawn, we always have to be worried about knight e5 tactics, right? Exactly. When you have a knight on h5. Yeah, a lot so of times this would here? be... Uh, nice, but yeah, knight takes e5, very typical tactic that you have to watch. But here there's bishop takes and queen h4 maybe. maybe. Oh, good point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, right, takes <laughs> here, it kind of, f4, you know, kind of like, it, uh... Bishop c3 and... It continues, yeah. yeah, take here, exactly. Yeah. And then I, I think mm -hmm. it actually, it works, right? It works. But again, like these are subtleties. Yeah, like exactly. Like. If there was like a pawn on h3, then maybe it wouldn't work. And then there's many cases where it does work, where on knight takes e5, um, black responds with f4, like super annoying mm. move. And then there, it's just like chaos, but it, it works out nicely. Uh, here, I don't think that would be the idea, but it, it is possible sometimes. So that's one option. It's like you get f5 in and then you can just take on e4. The other idea that's very, very important to know um, is that if white 
plays a3, trying to kind of save a tempo and play b4 in one move. Um, in many cases here as black, you got to be willing to play a4. And often this is like a straight up just a pure pawn sacrifice, like you're just giving up a pawn for really nothing immediate. Um, but if white does take this one and take this one, okay, here I think there's some tactics. We've got like 94 to justify this, but let's say white played knight d2 first. We make some move. White goes a3. Here I, I would say as well, black should play a4. And the idea would be you're forcing white to give up the dark squared bishop in order to grab this pawn. But in the future, black's dark squared bishop will definitely be worth its weight in gold. So the idea here would be to play f5, to play h5, get the bishop out via h6. And essentially, you kind of just have to like, let's say, believe in the compensation. You just have to believe that your dark squared bishop is going to be strong enough. But like, this is a typical way of kind of dealing with this a3, b4 plan. It's like if you can get a4 in mm -hmm. and just sack the pawn, a lot of times it's um, very much worth it. It's even more accurate to start with f5 because you're threatening f4. Mm -hmm. White would probably play f3 and, and then play a4 like this once white has uh, committed to, to f3. So the dark squares would be... Yeah, I'm pretty sure this, there is some game like this. I'm almost always seeing b3 and they're rarely allowing this a4 opportunity. But I really wanted to mention it because I feel like at lower levels, this one happens all the time. <laughs> and then right. black is kind of scared. They don't want to give the pawn, but like, nah, just do it, guys. Just do it. All right. You only live once. Sack the pawn. <laughs> get the dark squared bishop. You got to play brilliantly if you want to score a brilliancy. Okay. That's yeah. how it works. <laughs> Let me show you the other line that's been very popular in the last couple of years. It's uh, an option that black has against the H3 system which is also very trendy nowadays. The reason why I'm asking about something against h3, now I can reveal to everyone, is because I can't play the Benoni. h3 is so strong against c5, right? Because uh, they have this d5 line and they can go ed5. And mm. then I cannot play... Yeah, maybe you can show. Uh, right. Yes. And I can't trade my light square bishop. And I believe there's a line with rookie h check and bishop h6, but it's not good to go for the pawn. You're probably aware of this, right? Yeah, yeah. This is probably what I would even play as white or maybe through a different move order. But yeah, I feel like, I, I mean, I think it's very playable, but you would probably have to know a lot as black too to make this work. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's even like rookie three here, which is like fun. Um, oh. Yeah, this, this is this is a okay. line. Uh, it's been played by, you know, some really strong players. It's just a pure positional sacrifice. I'm sure it's... Mm -hmm. I'm sure it, it works fine in blitz. Um, like there's a couple of players, mm -hmm. I think they just play this regularly just because they're they're very familiar with it. I, I should say generally the move order that white chooses is they start with knight f3 and then after black mm -hmm. castles, uh, they go h3. So this is just something right. to, to keep in mind. But a lot of players these days, they start with h3 so that on castles, they can either go knight f3 or they can try bishop e3, for instance, has become really popular. Um, in the last several years. The main idea that this knight could eventually uh, go to e2, and then after g4, um, go to g3, where it's really well placed for uh, for white's play. I actually did a video on this one on our YouTube channel from white's point of view two or three years ago, because I thought it was like a really interesting system that white should play. White can also go bishop g5 here. Again, they'll probably go knight f3 at some point, but you know they kind of keep the knight flexible. Against this h3 move, there's been this like new kind of way of playing it for black. There's all like the, the typical lines with, with castles and lots and lots of options there. Um, but a few players started playing knight d7 here in this position. The main idea here is that if white goes bishop e3, black is playing e5. Usually white goes d5 here to close the center. And now the point is to play h5. So before black castles, they're playing h5 and then they're setting up Bishop h6, um, which feels very slow, but the point is it's like black has already committed or gotten white to commit to the center. And now, of course, this is like white's good bishop. This is black's bad bishop. So black is trying this like strategic idea. We see this in the French all the time with like a5 and bishop a6. Black is trying to trade off the bad bishop here and just leave white with uh, a bad light squared bishop. Typically, when white is playing the h3 systems, it's like they're trying to set up this long-term kingside attack with like g4 and then maybe h4, h5. 
And so to that aim, they definitely want to keep the center closed so that they can attack on the king side, maybe castle queen side, and, and so on. Um, and so yeah, if white were to just kind of hold the tension with something like knight of three here, then by all means, ed4, I think would be a very reasonable move, probably the main line. With the idea of just castling, mm -hmm. playing like rook e8, putting pressure on e4, and just asking white, like, what are you going to do about this pawn? Because if you play f3, then I'm going knight h5 and all your all your dark squares, especially like the g3 square, um, just gets absolutely roasted. So that's exactly what okay. I, yeah. So, so the line you're showing is specifically against h3 before knight f3 because we haven't castled yet. Yeah, so this is kind of the drawback of this one. Like if white plays the kind of classic way with knight f3, castles, and then h3, you're still going to need something here because knight d7 and e5, it doesn't work because you don't get this h5, bishop, h6. You need a, a rook on h8, folks, to defend that that bishop, just, just to make it really clear. That's why here h5 would not make a ton of sense. Um, but there are options here. You know, I personally, I would go like e5 myself, um, and then I play knight h5 here. White often plays g3, and then I like this line with knight a6, the particular line that I like, but there's other options as well. I think this one is still very much worth knowing because this is a very playable line. Um, I think it's definitely fresh enough, like most players won't be super familiar with it. The other thing is like just a very important point, by keeping the king on e8 for maybe a couple more moves, um, you're being quite flexible as black. And so the idea is that if white plays g4 like super early, then you can kind of take advantage of this and play h5 yourself, try to get white to kind of close the king side, and then it's gonna be very hard for white to actually do much more here, right? And then actually the king is very safe on g8 and you can play with e5, you can play with c5. So you're, typically white doesn't wanna close the king side down if their idea is to like attack and, and open things up, right? So it's like, uh, there's a lot of room for white to just go completely strategically wrong here. Would we do something similar against knight f3 here? Right, if knight f3, uh, you can play e5, and then you're wanting to take, so let's say d5. I think there's a couple different moves here, but a5 to me makes a lot of sense, where you're just waiting. <laughs> you're waiting for bishop e3, so then you can go h5 and bishop h6, just to kind of like save some time. Because if you play bishop, uh, h5 right away, then okay, white can save a tempo by not like moving the bishop, right? So I feel like this right. move kind of makes sense. It'll be useful in the structure, and then you're essentially waiting for this, and you can go h5, or like if bishop g5, you can go h6 first, and then bishop e3, you can go h5 again, and then go bishop h6. And a key idea here in this variation, other lines as well, the problem for white is if they go queen d2, which looks like it just stops this move, then black goes knight c5. And then the e4 pawn is hit, and there's no comfortable way to defend it, because if you go bishop d3, then minimum black can take on d3, let's say grab this light square bishop, some move like knight d7, bring the knight back and put this knight on c5. And I would say black is doing quite fine here. Eventually you can castle, play f5, and you have this unopposed light square bishop, which is definitely um, kind of nice. So this is certainly a, a try for white, but I would say it's not ideal. And then if you, how else can you defend the pawn? If you go queen c2, well then you allow bishop h6. Um, and just to quickly return to the original position, let's say white play bishop e3 here, as I think many players do when they start with this one, they want to kind of follow up with their idea. In this line after h5 as well, when white goes queen d2, knight c5, they can also try to go f3 to defend the pawn. But then what would you think is the best move here? Let me quiz you. I mean, my first instinct would be uh, h4. First instinct is correct. Very nice. That's what being a King's <laughs> Indian player is all about. You get to learn instincts. And then you don't even have to memorize moves. You just know. <laughs> you just know the move. H4, right? You fix the G3 square. You open up knight H5. And uh, it's a very, very nice plan for black to play in the dark squares. Theodora had a game like this against um, Solakito in an open tournament a couple years ago that went like this. White played bishop G5. And uh, he found a very nice move here. Maybe he had it prepped. I'm not sure. Bishop F8. The point oh, being that goodness. he's... Yeah, transferring the bishop to e7, and then he sets up this knight h5 move anyway. Such a nice move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very instructive. Once you see it, 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 it makes a lot of sense. But obviously, obviously, it wouldn't be obvious uh, if you didn't know the idea. <laughs> My game against the system was absolutely bananas. I played knight f3, and uh, I traded, and I played b4. So I kind of played for like the usual queenside play here as white. Um, this was my game against Grandmaster uh, Belarus, 
from uh, Vegas a couple of years ago. And uh, he just kind of showed the plan for black. He goes h4 here, fix some dark squares. Queen d2, he drops back. And then because the center is closed, black can just castle by hand here, king f8, king g7. And it's very solid. Um, so I tried a3, rook b1, he goes knight h5. And then I made a very bad decision here, queen g5. This was kind of based on uh, miscalculation. The idea was like, I want to trade queens and then try to like get knight b5 and be very annoying here. I think he could have gone for this anyway, but he just goes knight f6, sacrificing the h4 pawn, which I realize now like I don't want to take <laughs> because if I take this one, you know, black doesn't get knight f4 in right away, right? The rook is, is pinned, but he's just going to go king f8, king g7. And then eventually he's going to mm -hmm. get knight f4. White's queen is going to be totally stuck on the uh, king side. Yeah, also, at any moment, black can go a, b3 and rook a3. I think I was afraid of this as well during the game, where now the intention is to just like one day sack on f3 and just leave white with just like the worst, the worst structure ever. But I went c5, just hoping to open up the position. Um, but he just like calmly ignores everything here with king f8. And then I realize my mistake, I bring my queen back, but king g7, now I've lost so much time. Knight d2, knight f4, knight c4, queen e7, and yeah, here I just, I just totally collapsed. I just couldn't take it anymore, because now it's like, how does white even develop? If I move the bishop, you know, g2 is hanging. I can't go g3 without giving up a pawn. And, and so what, what do I do with my king? So I go king d1, trying to, you know, hide the king on, on c2. Um, but black just quickly opened things up. B5, just fantastic move. Take C6, just opening oh, up the wow. C file. Yeah. I didn't expect that. Okay. That's yeah, good. I don't know if, you know if you're familiar with Belus, but he's a very strong attacker. He just like, <laughs> he's mm -hmm. a madman. Takes, takes. And uh, yeah, th this, this just exploded very, very quickly. D5 now hitting this one, threatening D4. I think I just resigned here. I was just, I couldn't. I couldn't play anymore. <laughs> the position was just too, it was too lost uh, to... Uh, so to would you say game. this game inspired you to study this line as black? Yeah, when he played it against me, I, I had no idea about its existence. Um, so it was very, very uh, new at the time. That, that's really nice, nice idea. I, uh, I don't play the Kings Indian enough to know about all these uh, subtle variations. And uh, I guess from your perspective, you play it as white and as black right and mm -hmm. so you must often be in a king's indian <laughs> this has been a, an amazing uh, lesson i'm sure my community uh, really enjoyed it i think this lesson was definitely good for all levels but i can see a lot of stronger players really enjoy it because these ideas are really fresh and it's not easy to just study chess and discover these ideas so i, I think i think this was great uh, a lot of people in my chat really enjoyed it yeah it's definitely i think an opening that you you can play up to any level. Not that Benoni is like that terrible, but it can be yeah, it can be hard to play it like every game. You can um, say it, Kosia, I won't be offended. You, you can just say <laughs> No, it. I think I think the Kings in it just suffers from the same it, it's just hard to play it every game because it, it takes a lot of energy to like, you know, find all these like tactical ideas and stuff. And in many cases, when you're playing the King's Indian, I mean, like, you're going to get into a Benoni structure anyway, like, especially against, like, the F3 lines. Like, I feel like C5 is kind of considered the most critical approach um, in a lot of these positions. So you, you do have to be willing to play some Benoni structures anyway as a King's Indian player. The nice thing is, like, you right. have huge experience now, so you'll you'll always be comfortable <laughs> if, if that's the way to do it. Wait, was this, uh, wasn't this our first game in the Benoni, in the classical game? Didn't we have this game? Yeah, I, I don't remember if you, if you just played like straight up Benoni, but I think we, we got something like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, there was a knight g3, bishop g5, and then I chased yeah. the bishop away. Yeah, and I played uh, this line with white uh, for, for many years. Lo, lo, for sure. lo, lo, long story short, I, I know I know no one in chat has seen this game. If, if you guys want, you can Google it. Uh, 2016 St. Louis. Basically, I'm going to tell you a very, very short story. I'm, I'm getting this awful position again against you and um i i'm going for this b6 move which absolutely like never makes sense positionally do you, do you remember this or yeah, uh yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so so I, I okay long story short guys don't focus on the position but i i have to play a move that is absolutely um ugly it's really not good looking 
but but the problem is um i was sponsored by uh the chess bros to uh to go to st louis on that trip and at that very specific moment i'm about to play b6 and eric hansen walks into the room and uh he comes to see my game but i can't i just can't do it i can't play b6 in front of eric so i have to burn my clock for like five minutes until eric walks out of the room to play b6 <laughs> and, uh, I, I got really lucky because I think I sacked an exchange against you. It was really bad. And uh, yeah, I, I saved the game. <laughs> no, 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 so, I, uh, uh, that's a really funny detail. I never knew that actually. about that. <laughs> You never knew that, huh? <laughs> that's hilarious. Again, best of luck. And uh, thank you so much for today.